Rafael, uh, welcome you to Rock Hard Greece. Welcome to Rock Hard Greece. And uh, we'll speak about the, the story behind the uh, Holy Land. That's our that's our case for today. Okay. Um, so many things, so many questions. Let's begin. Let's cut to the chase. Okay. <laughs> Did you expect the impact that uh, Angel's Cry had, especially in Japan? Hmm. Angel's Cry. Um, we weren't very sure about it. We were very young and also very naive because we thought that we had a great material in hand. We had a great band. We knew that we had a contract with a record company. They were paying for, for music. They were paying for our, our, the, the production of the album. So we were very optimistic, obviously, because we had Andre Matos that had already two records with Viper. So he had some experience. He had a crowd. He had fans. He had connections with different managers. So when we started, we were very optimistic. Yes, because of, of the structure that was presenting in front of us, you know, record label contract, uh, advance money for the record. Uh, but obviously we never know how is it going to be the impact on people, like the human side of your music, how strong it connects, it connects to other people. But we know we had our strengths, you know. Uh, we know that we were able to play power metal, you know. But also we knew that we could combine other stuff. We were very open-minded for different genres of music. So I could say that a little bit because we were too naive. We were also a little bit, um, a little bit snob about yeah. ourselves <laughs> because we were too young and we felt too confident. Yeah. <laughs> is it true? Now that you mentioned the label that uh, was paying the advance for the for the album, is it true that your Japanese record label paid all the expenses for the production of Holy Land and your profit? Uh, was Rising Sun's uh, record deal in Europe? Um, yeah, I mean, I never say we. I can never say we did any profit out of any of these records, because usually we spend all the money on it, and it's like okay, there are other. There's another record company bringing us some in advance. Okay, let's do. It. Let's record a video clip. Let's pay for some. You know. Promote, promoting company. Yeah. So profit is something that I only saw on our third album, Fireworks, because of the tour, because mostly of because of the tour. But for us, it was always very expensive to to fly to Europe. Yeah, because you're to Brazil. Yeah, the whole band was from Brazil. Many times we had to, we wanted to to carry with us some crew member or two or three, you know, who knows? So it would take like 10 to 15 concerts for us to pay our expenses. So many times like, okay, we we, we do we do like a 20, 25 dates yeah. tour and we would have like profit out of the eight or five less yeah. concerts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, before recording Holy Land, you stayed in uh, a Brazilian countryside farm to write songs for the album. Uh, what made you isolate from the other people in order to write the songs for the album? Oh, right. Um, we all live, we used to live in Sao Paulo, Brazil. It's a very hectic and chaotic, huge city. And we all had lots of, lots of uh, commitments with other stuff. I was studying in a university, so was Andre. We were teaching, you know, guitar lessons, all that, all of that. But the idea we had girlfriends. The idea was to to really be hundred percent focused on doing a perfect album or doing the best album that we could. So 
uh, that was the idea. And also to get the inspiration. Yeah, we wanted on Holy Land, we wanted really to go deeper into the um, Brazilian atmospheres, musical atmospheres. For that, we needed to play a lot, research a lot, listen to stuff, to be together a lot, to exchange ideas. And that became like a protocol. Every time you want to do a great album, you just move out, stay together for in the same home, in the same place. I think it works for, for, uh, very good for the music, especially, especially when you're intending to do what we could call a organic uh, uh, process, organic com uh, songwriting process, which which means uh, in interaction with people. You know, when the music is a, is a fruit of of your the, the inner dynamics of the band, you know, like the relation among everyone, that chemistry, you know, that sparks and and fire that comes out of interaction. Uh, our music is a lot done uh, created from that, you know. The fire and all the sparks, the sparkles that comes from our uh, from our uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So it's good for us. It worked a lot, and we we keep doing it. I mean, our we we're, we're releasing a new album this year, and the same thing was done. We we went out for a place and stayed there. We lived together, and it. A lot of fire comes on, yeah. comes up, yeah. and and so does the music. Who insisted more on the folk elements of the album? Was it you? Was it Andre? Or was it a, a producer thing with uh, Sasha and uh, Charlie? No, the thing is, when it's... Uh, okay, Angra is a combination of two projects okay i was starting a band in the music university andre had left viper and he was like very focused on being a classic piano player all right uh i started a band with a bunch of friends and i wanted this band to to, to combine power metal hard rock and brazilian music and also some of the classical stuff that i was learning in the university well when Andrea came up, it was my project became also his project because he had a record company, he had a deal, he had a manager. So my thing was very, very amateur at the time. You know, I was starting a band, I was 19. But then with all that seriousness that Andrea brought, the, the, the band became, uh, became also his project. So the, the record company, they didn't want, um, well, the, the, in the beginning, the idea was to be a little bit more like inspired on Queen's Reich, Operation Mind Crime Empire. That was our focus, combining with Brazilian music. That's what my stuff, my thing. But in on Angels Cry, they, they, they didn't feel very confident on mixing too much weird stuff, especially because we all know how how conservative is the heavy metal audience, right? Yeah. Especially the power metal audience. So, yes, Brazilian music was something that I wanted a lot to combine into our stuff. When we went to record Angel's Crime, Sasha, uh, Charlie, and also Alex Holtz, the, 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 the drummer, the... Uh, the Brazilian stuff that we used to jam, not only the ideas in within our songs, but stuff that we would play just for fun. This was impressing them the most, you know. And we realized, actually, I could convince the guys that that was our uh, um, creme de la creme, you know. That was our best shot you know 
So um, on Holy Land, we were all convinced and and confident to, to bring more and to experiment more the Brazilian stuff into the very, very conservative power metal world. Mm -hmm. um, just a few days before the release of Holy Land, there was Roots by Sepultura. Another yeah. album that introduced it, uh, that introduced us to the Brazilian history, tribal rhythms, and all that stuff. Did it ever cross your mind uh, when you heard it that people might say that you were influenced by Sepultura, that uh, you did it because of Sepultura? Do you hear that even today? No, I, uh, well, I don't hear that much often, especially because. Uh, not the journalists, obviously, that are very aware of everything, many different genres of music, but the crowd usually is very separate. They many times they don't even know about the, the existence of Sepultura, the power metal crowd. But I might be saying bullshit, but uh, the uh, both albums were released almost at the same time. Yeah, like you, a, a couple few of months. It's yeah. just a couple of weeks. Not a, not even. Well, yeah, so it, it, it would be impossible yeah. to be inspired by something in two weeks and then deliver a new yeah. album that takes yeah. like a whole year yeah. Yeah. To, to do, you know. So yeah. um, if people think, I don't mind because I I admire Sepultura a lot. I remember when they released uh, Roots, it was a huge impact in, in I mean, in America and everywhere else bands that were created afterwards completely inspired like Slipknot was completely inspired on roots uh mainly like Rob Zombie and other other um artists coming from America they were very much inspired from roots so they were very proud that the Brazilian metal was in his peak you know mm -hmm. uh we had Angra and Sepultura Playing Brazilian stuff and and being popular around the world with that, yeah, so it was good. It was cool. Yeah. Uh, let me sign Let me let me sign my, my my cell phone just a second. You recorded the album in uh, Hanover, in Hamburg, and in Wolfsburg with Sasha. Yeah. Why had Andre stayed only in Wolfsburg while the rest of the band was elsewhere? Do you remember that? Well, it was different phases. Okay, mm -hmm. so. We recorded the drums and bass in Hamburg mm -hmm. at Kai Hansen's studio. I, I don't remember the name yeah. of the studio. Yeah. But then we moved to Big House Studio. I think it was Big House Studio there in Hanover to complete the guitars and the vocals. Then um, by, that, by that time, uh, Ricardo and Luis had flew back to Brazil. So... Me, Andre, and and Kiko, we went to Hanover. We stayed there like for the whole month to finish guitars and vocals. And then me and Kiko, we flew back to Brazil, and then and Andre went to Wolfsburg to to finish uh, keyboards and orchestras with Sasha. Mm -hmm. So it was like it was more like uh, the different phases of a plan. Yeah. Okay. Um, can you tell me finally what does ZITO mean? We've never had oh, right. an explanation for this. I think well, it's time yeah. for this I, after after uh, twenty seven years. Okay, it's a long story, but actually, it's a combination of of four different factors, right? Um, first of all, is a funny story that we had. It's an inside joke that we had. It's a story about a kid that uh, Ricardo Confessori met when he was a kid, too. They were very young. And they were in in contact with uh, ver first experimentations with masturbation. Mm -hmm. And so the younger one was, he had an older brother, and he wanted 
to masturbate until he would come. Mm -hmm. And and that was a little bit of, um, I didn't want that. Uh, it was funny story. We were always making fun because this younger one, he would call his brother Zito. His brother was called Zito. He would get, uh, Zito, come see if I come, if I came, right? Uh, because he didn't want, he didn't know, he was too young, he didn't know if he would, he could ejaculate. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is a very, uh, it was a funny story, we would always be like, Zito, come see if I came. <laughs> and it was funny, every time we would scream to each other, Zito, come see yeah, if yeah. I came. And when we were starting that song with this intro was made by Ricardo, I would always scream Zito. in a microphone, Zito, come see if I came. And then comes the riff. And I wanted that song to, to be called Zito since then. But other stuff, I mean, but it was just a story and um, it's too, it's too... How, how do I put it? I, I I wouldn't say I wouldn't be too specific in the lyric. Yeah. But but in the record was about the discovery of Brazil. I mean the the, the colonization of Brazil. Doesn't make any sense. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So how would I connect? Right. So I connected it to, like this. Um, human beings they have this urge of of uh experimenting new stuff this urge of discovering new ways of seeing life and stuff and that's the same feeling the same feeling of discovering a uh, masturbation yeah it's kind of the same thing that keeps us when we're older uh to explore the world like they've done so it's it's a it's the same feeling in different magnitude, okay? Yeah. That's what I put in the song. That's why the chorus goes like like a teenager discovery. What's more delightful than this? Uh, try to remember how good it was feeling the life as it is. So it's also about bliss, about pleasure, and about trying to discover. Uh, different pleasures in life and stuff and also glorious acts actions right <laughs> so i mean so i started to 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 write but i didn't want to to be too specific people were asking me what's the song about oh it's about a kid that ejaculates so i mean i made very, it after made 37 it. years you can say that yeah, I mean, nowadays. <laughs> but again, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you tell me, uh, uh, using Lullaby for Lucifer as an ending to your album, uh, did you want to close a circle and interconnected with uh, crossing. Yeah, just a sec. <coughs> I'm sorry. Bless you. <coughs> One more. Bless you again. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Mm, yeah, we wanted to have a, a, a dynamics in the album. <coughs> since Angels Cry, since our first album, we wanted to build a dynamic in our uh, in our album that starts with a huge punch, goes a little bit lower, and then rises up again. And then in the very end, there's this classic ballad that everyone like cools down uh, with the listening. So we wanted to have a cool and cooling down uh, feeling. And we had also Deep Blue. It's a very nice ballad, but the band is playing there. I had that ballad, Lullaby for Lucifer. We, I wrote it when I, when we were in the farm, away there in the farm. And so it felt 
it felt nice, you know, to have this ballad, this classic, but after Zito, after Make Believe, after Nothing to Say, after Carolina the Fourth, lot of, I mean, lots of energy and and punch and and speed matter with lots of elements and stuff. It's always nice to have, you know, like very slow ballad to to balance, I mean to re re retune the ears, you know, for the listeners. This is something that we've always done. We like to retune the, the, the ears with some it's some the balance. Or, it's yeah. just it's just a matter of balance in the record. Yes, um, that's a matter of balance. Okay. Yeah. Um what did you change the name of the song River to the Sky to Carolina Falls? Mm, that's a good one. Okay. Uh River to the Sky is this story of the record, okay? The record is about the discovery of Brazil, but why is that? Why why did we think of of telling the story of Brazil? Because I, I, on Angel Scribe, people loved the record, but they were wondering, okay, this guy's from Brazil. I mean, they're in the Amazon with alligators and snakes. How do they learn? How to play the guitar? We we had lots of these questions, curiosity about the fact of being Brazilian and playing our metal, right? Uh, so it was a way to explain, you know. Okay, here in Brazil, the Europeans came here. We have lots of different uh, Europeans families here. They combined with the uh, with the natives here, the culture, the religion the way of seeing uh, reality, and also with the the Afro-Brazilian people, right? Where the our music, our culture, our environment, uh, especially the cultural environment, was very, very much based on, on Afro-Brazilian culture. So we wanted to tell this story, tell the story of Brazil, we would explain it to people. Why do we have percussions? Why do we have classical stuff? Why do we have spiritual stuff? Uh, because this is all uh, what we are right? as me, as Brazilians. So that's we, we wanted to tell that story. But I didn't want to tell the story of Brazil, the history of Brazil. I didn't want to be uh, specific on facts. I wanted to create a fantastic story about uh, first of all, wondering about those boats that never got it, never got to find anything previous to the ones that did. You know, like previous to Columbus, previous to Cabral, the guy who, many who found Brazil. Many people found nothing. Many people found nothing and many people disappeared. Yeah. But, you know, yeah. because they were, we were still testing the ocean tides and, and currents and stuff. So I wanted to tell about a boat. Ah, then we have this story about one boat that disappeared and it took the river to the sky. It's like he, they sank, they sank into the ocean. But when you die, I was wondering, you could, you have a different perspective. I'm dying, but like in my I mean, in one of the layers of my consciousness, I could be living something else. You know, some people believe that we're going to have an experimenting, existing, like somewhere else, right? So I thought, what if when they died, they actually uh, seen, yeah, in their parallel universe, where they are now, they seen a river carrying them out of the sea, to the sky and then the boat flies up to the sky and that's their reality they don't know that they died they think that the boat took this river to the sky okay uh that was the idea for the song we were writing that song and then okay i was writing the lyrics about it the river to the sky but then we we started we we just we we wanted to do the photo session for the album and I wanted to do this photo session in a hill here in Brazil where you go above the clouds, you know, like the clouds go so low 
And when you go up to this hill, it's, 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 a, it's a high hill. It's a high mountain. It's called Pico da Neblina. It's called the, 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 the mist, the mist uh, mountain. Well, we, we would have to be there like around 5, 6 a.m. And we would do the, stay there and do the picture. I mean, the, the whole band, the idea was to have a picture above the clouds, you know, the river to the sky stuff. And we we rented a bus. This bus had the photographer, all the gear, the band, guy for makeup, because we had nothing up there. We had the manager, we had people assisting, we had people bringing food. And okay, we had this bus going then. We could we never made it because the bus got stuck. It was too too large, you know, for for, for, for the, the roads. Yeah. For was, the roads. Yeah. In a point, it got stuck. It almost, it almost fell down. I mean, the edge of the, the the cliff. So it was an adventure that went wrong, like the story that I was writing about. And the name of that bus, the bus had a name. You know, they had this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 The name of the bus was Carolina the Fourth. So. So. You I wrote the, about you, you, I wrote was, about a boat that tried to reach the new lands and tried to discover stuff that because they they were they were aware that the, the the earth was round all of that and so they were you know like oh let's if it's round we we should go like from here for that but they never found many stuff many of them never found anything uh, so I decided that the the boat of my story was called Carolina the Fourth, and ma many aspects in the in in the in the in the okay. lyrics, yeah, was stuff that really happened. Like um, we have with us a special guest, and for him we made a toast because the the, the guy who was going to to to, to the makeup guy, the makeup guy. Um, he had a funny way, you know, it was very um, feminine. Yeah. And we became, I mean, we had lots of fun and we made a toast for him. I think maybe it was his birthday or something. So things that we, we, uh, the, the that we live, that you I mean, yeah, yeah I, I, I wrote, I told it in a metaphorical way. I'm sorry to be long on my explanations, but many times no. when I do no, it no, no. in English, I get no. too long with my answers. You, uh, that's the that's a point. That's the whole point of speaking about the story about uh, an album. We've done stories about Operation Mind Crime, about scenes from my memory, about Rust in Peace. We've talked about many, many, many uh, great albums, and I I should tell you that Holy Land is uh, one of my, of my top ten albums of all time. And uh, I think you understand that I've listened to thousands of albums. Uh, yeah. In my whole <laughs> Thank life. you. Uh, will you ever use Spell, the only unreleased song of the Eyes of Christ demos? Sorry? Uh, there's, there's a song called Spell, I think. Oh, yeah, yeah, Eyes yeah. Of, Eyes of Christ demos. Will you ever, will it ever see the light of day? Um, uh, you're right. I mean, good question. It's a matter of bringing it up back to life. Well, when we there in the nineties, we we were always thinking of a CD format that had like around fifty minutes, so it was common to to leave lots of songs out. Also, for the schedule for the production, there was uh, you know, like. One more song is adding lots of hours into the production, but we so we had to keep it out. But maybe someday, who knows? We've we have done "Live and Learn." We have done "Eyes of Eyes Christ." Of Christ. Uh, yeah. In Hunters and Prey. Yeah, yeah. But, but still, we Eyes never of Christ. Done. Eyes of Christ is uh, is an item that every Angra fan who uh, respects himself. Uh, has to find so I have to ask you if if there is any way that we can get get hold of this uh, of this item if if 
it's only bootleg if i if I, I remember i remember that um there's a, there's another issue um when the band split when andre left uh it wasn't very friendly the we, 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 the, the 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 split wasn't too friendly and me and kiko we recorded the, the ones the songs that we were writing together like live, live and learn and eyes of christ were songs that me and kiko we were writing together uh, Spell is a song that um, had the involvement of Andre. You know, he's a co-writer of the song. So it was a bit more complicated to, yeah. to license, yeah. to authorize. Yeah. Yeah. I think nowadays I have a very good relationship with his family for his rights, for stuff that we always, um, yeah. you know, we have to pay stuff for him and, and consider him and be talking to his uh, about his rights with his family. I have a very good relationship, so releasing the song nowadays would be much easier. So it's a reality; it could come true someday. Yeah. Um, I don't find. Good. Got it. So, uh, we. We said about Eyes of Christ demos and the only song that uh, uh, has never appeared from Holy Land Sessions uh, to any of the Angra albums. Um, however, there's a, there's a Japanese bonus track uh, in the album. Uh, it's uh, Queen of the Night, which is of uh, Reaching Horizons. Yeah. Uh, it's one of the tracks that uh, never made it to the, to the debut album. Um, why did you choose that particular song as a Japanese bonus track? Do you think it fit the Japanese uh, uh, audience uh, better? Well, actually not, because usually the Japanese artists like fast stuff, like speed stuff with epic choruses. I think it's because we it's a song that we had, and it wouldn't it wouldn't be too complicated to record because it was already done the song and we always like to to give to the japanese audience a bonus also the record company is always very glad with that kind of stuff because um, usually the cities in japan they're more expensive than everywhere else yeah, so, so they, they had so yeah they fight numbers. against the import imports so they they're always struggling against the imports, and sometimes they release their their release date is like a little bit later than some release dates in Europe, and then they they lose the battle against the imports. So giving a bonus track, it's a reason for them to really having to buy the Japanese version. Mm -hmm. And a, and the Queen of the Night was a song. It's more like a hard rock song. And when we were, as I said, much more inspired by Queen's Right and other bands like that. Queen of uh, the Night. Yeah. Right, yeah. More than the speed and and power metal thing that became, that anger became afterwards. Speaking about bonus tracks, uh, here this version of mm -hmm. Land has the acoustic... Uh, uh, bonus, bonus acoustic CD recorded in France, and yeah. the live was recorded in France. The live album after, uh, yeah. Uh, release. Was France your biggest market in Europe back then? Yes, it was. But also, we had one of our main contributors, mm -hmm. one of the person that m helped Angra the most was Olivier Garnier. Okay, Olivier Garnier is a guy, friends, he's still there, he's a manager, he's a producer, he's one of the producers of Hellfest. Yeah. Uh, but back then, he had a small label, he was working on a label, and he really uh, fell in love with the band. He was very passionate about us, and so he done all his efforts to help position in Angra, in France, and all over Europe. So, yes, we had a good crowd there in France, but also we had Olivier Garnier that was always bringing ideas such as the acoustic, ethnic, 
bringing ideas such as recording a live album there in France. Uh, so he was always very helpful, and that's why we 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 were so good in France. Who had the idea for the cover of uh, Holy Land? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I had the idea. I had the idea of telling the story of the discovery of Brazil, because to justify the people, I mean, to explain to people why is that Angra? I mean, why is that this guys from Brazil that playing metal? Uh, you know, and also I wanted the the cover to be a map. First, I mean, on Angel Cry, one uh, we had already the 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 will of changing the cover, the metal cover stereotype, right? What's the stereotype of a metal cover? It's like usually a monster, a devil with skulls and fire and stuff happening. Lots of energy and dynamics in the cover. My favorite cover, for instance, is Iron Maiden, The Number of the Beast. It's, it's, I, I fell in love with that cover. I was like hypnotized with the devil and people suffering in hell and the number of the beast and all of that. It's a lot of action going in that cover. But when it came to Angra, my own band, I wanted to, to, to outstand in in the, the in the, the city stands in the the, the the stores in the record stores how would i stick out in uh in, in a store going the opposite way so instead of a movement i wanted a statue that's for an angel's cry and instead of a, of a devil i wanted an angel and that was like really sticking out in the in the middle of all these monsters and dragons and from other metal bands. Uh, with Holy Land, I wanted to keep that. So I wanted everything very plain, very still, very calm, like a map, you know. And we would unfold that map and discover, you know, the, a surprise, a bigger, a bigger... With a bigger a, picture, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, a bigger picture and a bigger experience with a cover, Su surprising people with a with a fuller experience of the cover, and it worked. How was it working for the first time with an orchestra, with choir, with classical instruments? Uh, okay, you have classical uh, uh, education. You you all uh, played music, uh, but you haven't. Uh, you hadn't, uh, of course, released an album using classical instruments by then and choirs and all that stuff that you use. How was it, this uh, experience for you, for the first time? Well, uh, in Holy Land, we were still working with samplers, yeah. samplers, but we had a real choir in the beginning. Hmm. We really, we have actually recorded the, that choir in the beginning, the Palestrina thing, the Renaissance choir. Um but we were still working with samplers. Andre and and Sasha were arranging with samplers. Mm -hmm. And it was very hard to do it back then because, I mean, technology was completely different than the one we have today. So, like, to, to have a violin line, you really you need to play note by note, adjust velocity or and everything to make it sound a little bit more uh, real or accurate. So... Um, yeah, but, we, but but in the booklet it says that there are certain people that have played certain instruments. Mm. You're right. You're right. Okay, those people are were from the the university we were studying. Andre uh, was a boyfriend. One of the the the, the, the I think the vi viola player, Renata. She was his uh, girlfriend, and her brother. Ricardo Kubala was a great violinist and they had a group they had a string quartet or something and they were also working with a Brazilian orchestra here so it was the chance to to add some to add some real violins violins to the samplers uh -huh. you know and this the, the violin player the one he, the, who played in Holy Land Ricardo he's a He's still 
uh, remembered here in Brazil as a great violinist. But during the the pandemics, he died of COVID. Mm. And also, the conductor of the choir, Naomi uh, Makunata, she she's also listed there in our uh, in our city. She also died of COVID here during the pandemics. Um, in Nature's Cry, uh, it was Alex Holzbart uh, who played the drums. Yeah. How did you take Ricardo as a drummer in your Holy, in Holy Land? Was it was he just a temporary replacement, uh, Alex? No, no, no. Right after the the release of our first album, uh, Angels Cry, we needed a drummer. We needed an actual drummer to be part of the band, and so we hired Ricardo as part of the band. We've done pictures. I mean, in most of the the releases, you see Ricardo on on the CD on Angels Cry CD just as a picture. But he was part of the band already. He took. He was part of the all the pre production process. He helped uh, writing mm -hmm. many of the songs. He is the one who came up with the idea for the, the nothing to say. Nothing to say. It seems yeah. that it's a, a pattern played in played in drums. The one string uh, notes that dun, dun, da, 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 it's like playing yeah. drums. Yeah. Yes, and um, it, it's a typical uh, rhythm from specific kind of samba. Here in Brazil, there are many kinds of samba, different rhythms for samba, but that's a rhythm for samba, and and he kind of was, you know, like trying to 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 do it in his drums and with a um, with more pressure and and punch, and then we've done the riff, the guitar riff, with, uh, to 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 follow with that drums. Mm -hmm. uh, is it true that Andre wanted to change the musical direction of the band drastically after Holy Land? No, no. We after Holy Land. The thing is, we have one of the, the 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 ideas in the beginning was to always surprise people with a new album. We thought that okay, uh, we presented. Angel's Cry was more like power metal, more more um, more traditional metal, um, um, traditional metal album. Then on Holy Land, we left like all those experimentations about uh, with Brazilian music on our third album. We wanted to be a little bit um, more free, to be a tribute to our uh, references, musical references. So our musical references was like Black Sabbath, Deep Purple, uh, Beatles, and um, Queen. All those, you know, classic uh, rock, rock and metal bands from the eighties and seventies. These were our influence, right? So we wanted to pay a tribute to those influences to really go back and and homage the the basis of metal, the basis of rock music, and that was basically it. And surprising people, we thought that it would be very positive to go like to so uh, to have people going like, oh, these guys, uh, they have some some. I mean, every time they bring a new album with different influences and stuff, which Nowadays, I think it's too good. Mm -hmm. uh, Nowadays, I think you have to stick to your style and just do it because people because don't care too much about like it. Be like ACDC. That's my motto. Just be like ACDC. Right? Yeah, I mean, the, same, the same patterns because if you, if you, even if you are a progressive band, progressive audience is not so progressive as we think. Uh, yeah, I mean. Yeah, it's more conservative than the conservatives. Uh, <laughs> so they, they want you to play uh, like the, the album they like. Just make yes. part two, part three, part four. That's not right. progressive music, that's not progression, but you have to live <laughs> somehow. Mm. Yeah. Uh, what did you use a lyrical assistance by John Newman? Uh, weren't you, were you afraid that your English might not be good enough? Uh, yeah, I've, I've always, I've always accepted lyrical existence from different people Yeah, because, um, even when your English is all right to yeah. write and then you have automatic corrections and stuff, um, I, I, I live in Brazil, I speak Portuguese most of the time 
and many expressions of how to express stuff yeah. could not be in the best way. So I have always yeah. used that as a good thing for us. Yeah. It always helps. Was it conflicting to have Antonio Pirani as your personal manager and Lynn Schnorr as your business manager? Did they did they have conflicts between each other? Who No, they've always they've always got along very well. We needed someone in Europe, you know, because the relation with record companies, especially back then when we didn't have internet like this. Everything was done by phone calls and many times by fax or or even letters, written letters. So we needed someone in Europe to take care of stuff and someone with more experience than us and then Antonio. Antonio had, uh, he owned a, a metal magazine here in Brazil, but uh, being a manager wasn't his main thing. So we, we needed someone and he got along very well with them, their friends. I think up to today, they're still friends and they it was always very harmonic, this relationship. Now that you mentioned the fact, I just remembered that our first interview was done by fax during the Holy Land days. See? <laughs> I sent you a fax <laughs> and you got that. I yeah. guess... I guess uh, younger people that will see and read this interview won't understand what uh, what a fax machine is and what it's yeah. how to exchange faxes. But it yeah. was 27 years ago when I sent you questions about this very album that we are speaking right now. <laughs> That's 26, seven years. I was talking to, I was doing, uh, I have a, I have a YouTube channel here in Brazil where I talk to other musicians, other artists in general. And I was talking to this friend of mine. He's a bit older than me. And he, he was talking when he had a TV, he, he had a TV show. And back then when the TV was black and white and we had like this, this round thing to change channel. And we only had 13 channels on our TVs. And before the to, remote control, before, the before remote, remote control, we really had to, you know, like to twi to twig uh, different channels from this knob. And I was explaining that to, 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 to fans. They were going, they were going like, huh? You live until this? Like, until I mean, you, you were alive. Yes, yeah, yeah. Until yes. until nineteen eighty six or eighty seven, we had two, maximum three channels, switched by by hand. Yes. <laughs> and so what, it's what funny to remember how quick <laughs> technology developing developed. And we were waiting for the slides of the for the photos of the album so that we can use slides in the magazines back then. Oh, uh, you're right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And sometimes we missed deadlines for cover stories because the the slides were not uh, on time. Yeah, because they were mailed. Yeah. We had to we had to mail stuff, material for everything for promoting the album. I, I for journalists. I, I, was... I, I found some uh, Christmas cards from the Angra fan clubs and this Reaching Horizons thing. Yeah, nice. Seem seem like uh, you know uh, prehistoric and like Flintstones to the younger people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we but, used to do our own fanzine. Yeah. We yeah. used to do I our have own many, fanzine I have like from that, yeah. Yeah, like telling the news about Angra, what, what's going on. Because, I mean, obviously metal was always like a little aside from the media, from the mainstream. So we've done our own fanzine and we would like mail it to people so they would be aware of what's going on and what's, what's happening in an Angra world. What do you remember from this amazing show in, in Athens, in Greece? Uh, for the tour of Holy Land? Well, I remember that everything went smooth and it worked. We were very round as a band. We were performing very nice. Uh, I was so proud of the band that I was in with Andre, so charismatic and excellent performer. Nico, which up to today is one of the best guitar players that we know. Ricardo and Luis is like very tight and groovy 
uh, drum and bass. And I was, I had the privilege to watch the concert on stage. I felt a little bit like off as a performer, but I was also a thinker, you know, I had ideas, I brought this to them. They always respected me as a musician, as a, a, a guy who brings idea and strategy, 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 strategy. Yeah. Yeah. So, so I remember the crowd. I remember that the, there was this balcony. Yeah. It was like a very high place with a balcony. People were carrying flags and stuff like we love Angra or stuff like this. And they were very wild. We also played the Salonik, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we played Athens and Thessalonik. Both concerts were like very good. And by the way, just recently we were trying to book more concerts in 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 Greece, just because we miss being there, you know, just because we wanted to be back to in Greece and visit the country, maybe spend a few days there. We couldn't make it work this time, but hopefully, in the near future we will. Let's let's hope for that. Let's hope for that. And what when uh, shall we expect your new album? I think it's going to be released uh, in 2023. Oh, yeah. It's got to be released this year. We want to release it between October and November. We can't precise the date because we're still finalizing it. So until we deliver the masters uh, or if we have a specific date for the deliverance, which I think will be uh, the end of April, mm -hmm. right? We're finalizing choirs, lead guitars and stuff. Um, but around uh, October and November, it's like Should two months. Should we expect of, any surprises? Surprises? Always, right? We always try to surprise people. But um, what I can say is that we're on our third generation. I call different generations, or okay. MK3. We're on the like yeah, we, we're on the generation three, and it's our third album, you know, yeah. with this lineup, and I think it's probably the, the best album we've done with this lineup, and hopefully, it's going to be iconic. The so one thing it that is very hard you mentioned the CDC, for instance, there's always like repeating themselves in a very fresh way which is very hard you yeah. know yeah to repeat the patterns and and still people think oh this is nice it's fresh it's yeah. i like it's rocking right it's even more difficult. some other people they need to to adapt they need to recycle the music and that's our case because especially when you have such uh such such a great uh, lineup changes, right? But what I feel is now that we are very uh, connected personally and musically. Mm -hmm. We're more relaxed, you know, like just to bring out ideas without uh, worrying too much about what people will think. Uh, we could experiment a little bit in this album, new sounds and stuff, but also commit to the original concept, you know, so people will hear the original ideas, but also hear that we're heading somewhere else many times. So it's very, very musical, melodic, with nice and beautiful uh, musical parts. So I think people will be, will be very impressed that we've survived, yeah, yeah. that we've recycled for the third time, and that we're still a reference for the Latin American scene. Yeah. Do you think that we've missed uh, any uh, interesting story about Holy Land uh, before reaching the end of this interview? Do you think that... Uh, well, when we stayed out in the farm, it was so many funny stories, like huge spiders that we would uh, <laughs> face after a while we, we would, I mean, get used to it. And there was this uh, uh, this thunder strike. Okay, it used to rain a lot there. It was like very close to the rainforest, but uh, on where we were 
and there was lots of of thunderbolts, you know, like real yeah. that would that would explode. I mean, huge uh, thunder sounds. And one day, Andra was was in his room. He had a keyboard in his room set up with headphones and computer and stuff that he would be working on. And it was raining. And then there's this huge thunder wind and lightning, lots of lightnings. And then like we, we only saw that huge light going now and the huge sound coming. After a few seconds comes Andre to the living room. We were, it was at night. We were in the living room and Andre, he had a metal keyboard stand, right? He said he was um, he was with his elbow on the keyboard stand when when the lightning came. He felt this huge electric shock, and he had like sparkle hair and like all oh, this. <laughs> yeah, he was very scared, and his heart was going like this a little bit because of the fright and a little bit because of the electricity. Electricity, yeah. Yeah, so was and he. Yes, he could he could have died, you know. And he comes in the living room, like all scared, and going like guys, he was guys here and, and sunglasses. You guys, uh I think I got electrocuted by the lightning. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and we were laughing. Poor Andre. We were laughing because we never took anything and too serious. Yeah. And we were laughing and he was, guys, it's serious. I almost died. And we, and we laughed even more. <laughs> But I believe that um, something happened, you know, like it was a real shock for him, real shock, like literally a shock. Yeah. And, um, and thank God that he lived.